Occitan Literature, Wikipedia Article Audio Occitan Literature is a body of texts written in Occitan, mostly in the south of France. It was the first literature in a Romance language and inspired the rise of vernacular literature throughout medieval Europe. Occitan literature's golden age was in the 12th century, when a rich and complex body of lyrical poetry was produced by troubadours writing in Old Occitan, which still survives to this day. Although Catalan is considered by some a variety of Occitan, this article will not deal with Catalan literature, which started diverging from its southern French counterpart in the late 13th century. Introduction Origin Age of the Troubadours Early Period Golden Age, Trabar Lou, Trubar Clus, and Trabar Rick Later Troubadours, and Foreign Ones Troubadours and Society Patronage France Aragon Castile and Leon Italy Form Narrative poetry Didactic and religious poetry Drama Fa copyright Libridge Late 20th and 21st century Notes Occitan literature started in the 11th century in several centers. It gradually spread from there, first over the greater portion of southern France, and then into Catalonia, Galicia, Castile, Portugal, and into what is now the north of Italy. In its rise Occitan literature stands completely by itself, and in its development it long continued to be highly original. It presents at several points analogies with French literature, but these analogies are due principally to certain primary elements common to both and only in a slight degree to mutual reaction. Occitan poetry first appeared in the 11th century. The oldest surviving text is the Provena Alberton attached to a 10th century Latin poem. The text has not yet been satisfactorily interpreted. The quality of the earliest remaining works suggest earlier work was lost. The earliest Occitan poem is a 10th century, 17 line charm tomata femina, probably for dispersing the pain of childbirth. Much longer is an 11th century fragment of 257 decasyllabic verses preserved in an Orla copyright ANS manuscript, first printed by Rain Ward. It is believed to have come from Limousin or March in the north of the Occitan region. The unknown author takes Boethius's treatise De Consolationi Philosophiae as the groundwork of his composition. The poem is a didactic piece composed by a clerk. The Cana A superscript 3 de Santa Fe dates from 1054 A Euro 76, but probably represents a Catalan dialect that evolved into a distinct language from Occitan. From the same century there is Los, Chuai non sun sparver, a stir, a secular love poem. From the next century are the poems of William IX, the grandfather of Eleanor of Aquitaine. They consist of eleven diverse strophic pieces, and were consequently meant to be sung. Several are love songs. The only one which can be approximately dated was composed around 1119, when William was setting out for Spain to fight the Saracens. It expresses the writer's regret for the frivolity of his past life and his apprehensions as he bade farewell to his country and his young son. We also know from Ordericus Vitalis that William had composed various poems on the incidents of his ill-fated crusade of 1101. In one of his pieces he makes an allusion to the Parthenon. The origins of this poetry are uncertain. It bears no relation to Latin poetry, nor to folklore. 
Vernacular compositions seem to have been at first produced for the amusement, or in the case of religious poetry, for the edification, of that part of lay society which had leisure and lands, and reckoned intellectual pastime among the good things of life. In the 11th century, vernacular poetry served mainly the amusement and edification of the upper class. By the 12th and 13th centuries, historical works and popular treatises on contemporary science were composed in the vernacular. Occitan poetry may have originated amongst the gestures. Some, leaving buffoonery to the ruder and less intelligent members of the profession, devoted themselves to the composition of pieces intended for singing. In the north, the jesters produced chansons de geste full of tales of battle and combat. In the courts of the southern nobles they produced love songs. Starting in the early 12th century, the best-known body of Occitan literature originated with the group of poets who would later become known as troubadours, from the verb trabar meaning to invent. The troubadours used a standardized form of old Occitan, sang their pieces to music and generally used complex and elaborate meters. Their poetry was usually lyrical, with a minority of pieces of satirical, political, moralistic, religious, or erotic nature. The first known troubadour was William IX. Duke of Aquitaine whose works gave the movement a position of honor, and indirectly contributed in a very powerful degree to ensure its development and preservation. Shortly after him, centers of poetic activity made their appearance in various places, first in Limousin and Gascony. In the former province lived Ebolus Contateur, who during the second part of William of Poitiers' life seems to have been brought into relation with him, and according to a contemporary historian, Geoffroy, prior of Vigewa, Erat Vald Graciosus in Cantilenus. None of his compositions survive, but under his influence Bernard of Ventadour was trained to poetry, who, though only the son of one of the serving men of the castle, managed to gain the love of the Lady of Ventadour, and when on the discovery of their amour he had to depart elsewhere, received a gracious welcome from Eleanor of Aquitaine, consort of Henry II of England. Of Bernard's compositions we possess about fifty songs of elegant simplicity, some of which may be taken as the most perfect specimens of love poetry Occitan literature has ever produced. Bernard must therefore have been in repute before the middle of the 12th century, and his poetic career extended well on towards its close. At the same period, or probably a little earlier, flourished Sir Common, of genuine importance among the troubadours both because of his early date and because definite information regarding him has been preserved. He was a Gascon, and composed says his old biographer, pastorals according to the ancient custom. This is the record of the appearance in the south of France of a poetic form which ultimately acquired large development. The period at which Sir Common lived is determined by a piece where he alludes very clearly to the approaching marriage of the King of France, Louis VII, with Eleanor of Aquitaine. Among the earliest troubadours may also be reckoned Marc Abreu, a pupil of Sir Common, from whose pen we have about forty pieces, those which can be approximately dated ranging from 1135 to 1148 or thereabout. This poet has great originality of thought and style. His songs, several of which are historical, are free from the commonplaces of their class, and contain curious strictures on the corruptions of the time. We cannot here do more than enumerate the leading troubadours and briefly indicate in what conditions their poetry was developed and through what circumstances it fell into decay and finally disappeared, Pierre d'Alvernha, who in certain respects must be classed with Marc Abreu, Arnaud Daniel, 
remarkable for his complicated versification, the inventor of the Sestina, a poetic form for which Dante and Petrarch express an admiration difficult for us to understand, are not de Meruel, Bertrand de Born. Now the most generally known of all the troubadours on account of the part he is said to have played both by his sword and his serviniescas in the struggle between Henry II of England and his rebel sons, though the importance of his part in the events of the time seems to have been greatly exaggerated, Pierre Vital of Toulouse, a poet of varied inspiration who grew rich with gifts bestowed on him by the greatest nobles of his time, Girard de Borneal, Lo Maxire del Strabaters. And at any rate master in the art of the so-called close style, though he has also left us some songs of charming simplicity, Gauselm Fadet, from whom we have a touching lament on the death of Richard C. A. Ur de Lyon, Falke of Marseille, the most powerful thinker among the poets of the South, who from being a merchant and troubadour became an abbot, and finally Bishop of Toulouse. As the troubadours started scattering from southern France after the Albigensian Crusade, the quality of their poetry decayed sharply, Dante, in his De Vulgari Eloquentia mentions only authors of the previous generation as models of vernacular literature. However, the presence of troubadours in foreign courts engendered a number of imitators in Catalonia and Italy. It is not without interest to discover to what social classes the troubadours belonged. Many of them, there is no doubt, had a very humble origin. Bernard of Ventadour's father was a servant, Pierre Vitals a maker of furred garments, Pertigan S. A. Fisher. Others belonged to the bourgeoisie, Pierre d'Alvernha, for example, Pierre Raymond of Toulouse, and Elias von Salada. Likewise we see merchants' sons as troubadours, this was the case with Falke of Marseille and Amaric de Pigilhan. A great many were clerics, or at least studied for the church, for instance, Arnaud de Meruel, UC de Saint Circ, Amaric de Belinoy, Hugh Brunet, Pierre Cardinal, some had even taken orders the monk of Montaudin and Gobert de Puisibet. Ecclesiastical authority did not always tolerate this breach of discipline. Guy de Ussel, canon and troubadour, was obliged by the injunction of the pontifical legate to give up his song-making, Falke, too, renounced it when he took orders. One point is particularly striking, the number of monarchs and nobles who were troubadours, Raymond de Miraval, Pons de Capdoil, Guillem Ademar, Cadenet, Pyrol, Raimbot de Vaqueiras, and many more. Some of this group were poor knights whose incomes were insufficient to support their rank, and took up poetry not merely for their own pleasure, but for the sake of the gifts to be obtained from the rich whose courts they frequented. A very different position was occupied by such wealthy and powerful people as William of Poitiers, Raimbaud de Orenga, the Viscount of St. Antonin, Guillaume de Berguda and Blakets. The profession was entirely dependent on the existence and prosperity of the feudal courts. The troubadours could hardly expect to obtain a livelihood from any other quarter than the generosity of the great. It will consequently be well to mention the more important at least of those princes who are known to have been patrons and some of them practicers of the poetic art. They are arranged approximately in geographical order, and after each are inserted the names of those troubadours with whom they were connected. While the troubadours found protectors in Catalonia, Castile and Italy, they do not seem to have been welcomed in French-speaking countries. This, however, must not be taken too absolutely. Occitan poetry was appreciated in the north of France. There is reason to believe that when Constance, daughter of one of the Counts of Alls, was married in 1001 to Robert, 
king of France, she brought along with her Provena al Jongleur. Poems by troubadours are quoted in the French romances of the beginning of the 13th century, some of them are transcribed in the old collections of French songs, and the preacher Robert de Sorbon informs us in a curious passage that one day a jongleur sang a poem by Falke of Marseilles at the court of the King of France. Since the countries of the Long d'Oil had a full developed literature of their own, the troubadours generally preferred to go to regions where they had less competition. The decline and fall of troubadour poetry was mainly due to political causes. When about the beginning of the 13th century the Albigensian crusade led by the French king had decimated and ruined the nobility and reduced to lasting poverty a part of the Occitan territories, the profession of troubadour ceased to be lucrative. It was then that many of those poets went to spend their last days in the north of Spain and Italy, where Occitan poetry had for more than one generation been highly esteemed. Following their example, other poets who were not natives of the south of France began to compose in Occitan, and this fashion continued till, about the middle of the 13th century, they gradually abandoned the foreign tongue in northern Italy, and somewhat later in Catalonia, and took to singing the same airs in the local dialects. About the same time in the Provena Al region the flame of poetry had died out save in a few places, Narbonne, Rhodes, Foy, and Astarac where it kept burning feebly for a little longer. In the 14th century, composition in the language of the country was still practiced, but the productions of this period are mainly works for instruction and edification, translations from Latin or sometimes even from French with an occasional romance. As for the poetry of the troubadours, it was dead forever. Originally the poems of the troubadours were intended to be sung. The poet usually composed the music as well as the words, and in several cases he owed his fame more to his musical than to his literary ability. Two manuscripts preserve specimens of the music of the troubadours, but, Though the subject has been recently investigated, we are hardly able to form a clear opinion of the originality and of the merits of these musical compositions. The following are the principal poetic forms which the troubadours employed. The oldest and most usual generic term is ver, by which is understood any composition intended to be sung, no matter what the subject. At the close of the 12th century, it became customary to call all verse treating of love canso the name ver being then more generally reserved for poems on other themes. The Cervantes differs from the ver and the canso only by its subject, being for the most part devoted to moral and political topics. Pyre Cardinal is celebrated for the Cervantes as he composed against the clergy of his time. The political poems of Bertrand de Born are Cervantescas. There is reason to believe that originally this word meant simply a poem composed by a servant or man at arms. The Cervantesque is very frequently composed in the form, sometimes even with rhymes, of a love song having acquired some popularity, so that it might be sung to the same air. The tenson is a debate between two interlocutors each of whom has a stanza or more generally a group of lines in turn. The partiman is also a poetic debate, but it differs from the tenson insofar that the range of debate is limited. In the first stanza one of the partners proposes two alternatives, the other partner chooses one of them and defends it, the opposite side remaining to be defended by the original propounder. Often in a final couplet a judge or arbiter is appointed to decide between the parties. This poetic game is mentioned by William, Count of Poitiers, at the end of the 11th century. The Pastoretta, afterwards Pastorella, is in general an account of the love adventures of a knight with a shepherdess. All these classes have one form capable of endless variations, 
five or more stanzas in one or two envoys. The danza and ballada, intended to mark the time in dancing, are pieces with a refrain. The obad, which has also a refrain, is, as the name indicates, a waking or morning song at the dawning of the day. All those classes are in stanzas. The discord is not thus divided, and consequently it must be set to music right through. Its name is derived from the fact that, its component parts not being equal, there is a kind of discord between them. It is generally reserved for themes of love. Other kinds of lyric poems, sometimes with nothing new about them except the name, were developed in the Occitan regions, but those here mentioned are the more important. Although the lyrical poetry of the troubadours formed the most original part of Occitan literature, it was not the only kind. Narrative poetry, especially, received in Occitania a great development, and, thanks to recent discoveries, a considerable body of it has already become known. Several classes must be distinguished, the chanson de geste, legendary or apparently historical, the romance of adventure and the novel. All these poems are in the form of chansons de geste, that is, in stanzas of indefinite length, with a single rhyme. One notable example is the saga of Girard de Roussilla, a poem of 10,000 verses, which relates the struggles of Charles Martel with his powerful vassal the Burgundian Girard of Roussilla. Girard de Roussilla belongs only within certain limits to the Occitan literature, as it exists in two versions, one in Old Occitan and one in a hybrid language which seems to have originated on the borders of Limousin and Poitou, both are probably a recast of an older poem, probably either of French or Burgundian origin, which is no longer extant. To Limousin also seems to belong the poem of Agar and Morin, of which we have only a fragment so short that the subject cannot be clearly made out. Of less heroic character is the poem of Doral and Betterne, connected with the cycle of Charlemagne but, judging by the romantic character of the events, more like a regular romance of adventure. We cannot, however, form a complete judgment in regard to it, as the only manuscript in which it has been preserved is defective at the close, and that to an amount there is no means of ascertaining. Midway between legend and history may be classified the Kansas superscript 3 d Antioca, a mere fragment of which, 700 verses, has been recovered in Madrid and published in Archives de l'Orient Latin, Vol. 2. This poem, which seems to have been composed by a Gregoire Bicata, Mentioned in a 12th-century chronicle and written in Limousin is one of the sources of the Spanish compilation La Gran Conquista de Ultramar. To history proper belongs the song of the Albigensian Crusade, which, in its present state, is composed of two poems tacked onto each other, the first, containing the events from the beginning of the Crusade till 1213 is the work of a cleric named William of Tudela, a moderate supporter of the Crusaders, the second, from 1213 to 1218, is by a vehement opponent of the enterprise. The language and style of the two parts differs as well. Finally, around 1280, Guillaume Anelier, a native of Toulouse, composed a poem on the war carried on in Navarre by the French in 1276 and 1277. It is an historical work of little literary merit. Gerard of Roussilla, Agar, and Morin and Doral and Betern are in verses of ten, the others in verses of twelve syllables. The peculiarity of the versification in Girard is that the pause in the line occurs after the sixth syllable, 
and not, as is usual, after the fourth. Like the chanson de geste, the romance of adventure is but slightly represented in the South, but it is to be remembered that many works of this class must have perished, as evidenced by the fact that, with few exceptions, the narrative poems which survived are known by a single manuscript only. Only three Provena al romances of adventure are extant, Joffrey, Blandon of Cornwall and Gillam de la Barra. The first two are connected with the Arthurian cycle. The romance of Gillam de la Barra tells a strange story also found in Boccaccio S. de Cameron, it was finished in 1318, and is dedicated to a noble of Languedoc called Sicart de Montaut. Of these, only Joffrey is considered of any literary merit. Connected with the romance of adventure is the novel, which is originally an account of an event newly happened. The novel must have been at first in the South what, as we see by the Decameron, it was in Italy, a society pastime with the wits in turn relating anecdotes, true or imaginary, which they think likely to amuse their auditors. But before long this kind of production was treated in verse, the form adopted being that of the romances of adventure octosyllabic verses rhyming in pairs. Some of those novels which have come down to us may be ranked with the most graceful works in Provena al literature, two are from the pen of the Catalan author Raymond Vidal de Basalu. 1. The Castillagillos, is a treatment, not easily matched for elegance, of a frequently handled theme the story of the husband who, in order to entrap his wife, takes the disguise of the lover whom she is expecting and receives with satisfaction blows intended, as he thinks, for him whose part he is playing, the other, the judgment of love, is the recital of a question of the law of love, departing considerably from the subjects usually treated in the novels. Mention may also be made of the novel of the parrot by Arnaud de Carcassonne, in which the principal character is a parrot of great eloquence and ability, who succeeds marvelously in securing the success of the amorous enterprises of his master. Novels came to be extended to the proportions of a long romance. Flamenca, which belongs to the novel type, has still over 8,000 verses, though the only miss of it has lost some leaves both at the beginning and at the end. This poem, composed in all probability in 1234, is the story of a lady who by very ingenious devices, not unlike those employed in the Miles Gloriosus of Plautus, succeeds in eluding the vigilance of her jealous husband. No analysis can be given here of a work the action of which is highly complicated. Suffice it to remark that there is no book in medieval literature which betokens so much quickness of intellect and is so instructive in regard to the manners and usages of polite society in the 13th century. We know that novels were in great favor in the south of France, although the specimens preserved are not very numerous. Statements made by Francesco de Barberino, and recently brought to light, give us a glimpse of several works of this class which have been lost. From the Occitan territories the novel spread into Catalonia, where we find in the 14th century a number of novels in verse very similar to the Provena al ones, and into Italy, where in general the prose form has been adopted. Compositions intended for instruction, correction, and edification were very numerous in the south of France as well as elsewhere, and, in spite of the enormous losses sustained by Provena al literature, much of this kind still remains. But it is seldom that such works have much originality or literary value. Originality was naturally absent as the aim of the writers was mainly to bring the teachings contained in Latin works within the reach of lay hearers or readers. Literary value was not of course excluded by the lack of originality, 
but by an unfortunate chance the greater part of those who sought to instruct or edify, and attempted to substitute moral works for secular productions in favor with the people, were, with a few exceptions, persons of limited ability. It would be out of question to enumerate here all the didactic treatises, all the lives of saints, all the treatises of popular theology and morals, all the books of devotion, all the pious canticles, composed in Occitan verse during the Middle Ages, still some of these poems may be singled out. Daud de Pradas, a canon of Maglone, and at the same time a troubadour, has left a poem, the Ozils Cassaders, which is one of the best sources for the study of falconry. Raymond de Vignon, otherwise unknown, translated in verses, about the year 1200, Rogier of Parmes Surgery. We may mention also a poem on astrology by a certain C, and another, anonymous, on geomancy, both written about the end of the 13th century. As to moral compositions, we have to recall the Boethius poem already mentioned as one of the oldest documents of the language, and really a remarkable work, and to notice an early metrical translation of the famous Distica de Moribus of Dionysius Cato. More original are some compositions of an educational character known under the name of Ensenumens, and, in some respects, comparable to the English nurture books. The most interesting are those of Garen L. E. Brunn, Arnaud de Meruel, Arnaud Guillem de Marson, Amanu de Sescas. Their general object is the education of ladies of rank. Of metrical lives of saints we possess about a dozen, among which two or three deserve a particular attention, the life of Sanctifides, recently discovered and printed Romania, XXXI written early in the 12th century, The Life of Saint Anemia, by Bertrand of Marseilles, and that of Saint Honora of Larens by Raymond Ferrod, which is distinguished by variety and elegance of versification, but it is almost entirely a translation from Latin. Lives of saints form a part of a poem, strictly didactic which stands out by reason of its great extent and the somewhat original conception of its scheme, the Breviars Damer, a vast encyclopedia, on a theological basis, composed by the Menorite friar Matfra Ermengod of Bezers between 1288 and 1300 or thereabout. Dramatic literature in Occitan consists of mysteries and miracle plays seldom exceeding two or three thousand lines, which never developed into the enormous dramas of northern France, whose acting required several consecutive days. Comic plays, so plentiful in medieval French literature, do not seem to have found favor in the South. Specimens which we possess of Occitan drama are comparatively few, but researches in local archives, especially in old account books, have brought to light a considerable number of entries concerning the acting, at public expense, of religious plays, called, in Latin documents, Historia or Moralitas, most of which seem to be irretrievably lost. The sponsus, in both Latin and Occitan, is preserved from the mid-11th century and may have non-liturgical roots. It shows originality in both the treatment of its biblical theme and its musical accompaniment, since it was sung in its entirety. As all the Occitan plays, sometimes mere fragments, which have escaped destruction, are preserved in about a dozen manuscripts, unearthed within the last 40 or 50 years. Generally those plays belong to the 15th century or to the 16th. Still, a few are more ancient and may be ascribed to the 14th century or even to the end of the 13th. The oldest appears to be the mystery of Saint Agnes, written in Alls. Somewhat more recent, 
but not later than the beginning of the 14th century, is a Passion of Christ and a Mystery of the Marriage of the Virgin, which is partly adapted from a French poem of the 13th century. A manuscript, discovered in private archives, contains not less than 16 short mysteries, three founded on the Old Testament, 13 on the New. They were, written in Rouerg and are partly imitated from French mysteries. At Manisk was found a fragment of a Ludus Sanx Jacobi inserted in a register of notarial deeds of some kind. In 1513 French poems were first admitted in the competitions, and under Louis XIV these were alone held eligible. This unfair arrangement, by which some of the leading poets of northern France profited, held good till 1893, when the town very properly transferred its patronage to a new Escalo Mountino, but very soon restored its support to the older institution, on learning that Occitan poetry was again to be encouraged. In the two centuries that followed the glorious medieval period we have a succession of works, chiefly of a didactic and edifying character, which scarcely belong to the realm of literature proper, but at least served to keep alive some kind of literary tradition. This dreary interval was relieved by a number of religious mystery plays, which, though dull to us, probably gave keen enjoyment to the people, and represent a more popular genre, the latest that have come down to us may be placed between the years 1450 to 1515. Not only did the literature deteriorate during this period, but dialects took the place of the uniform literary language employed by the troubadours, while the spoken tongue yielded more and more to French. In 1539 Frana Oisi, with the ordinance of Villers Cotteretes, forbade the use of Occitan in official documents a fact that is worthy of note only as being significant in itself not as an important factor in the decadence of Provena al letters. On the contrary, just about this time, there are signs of a revival. In 1565 the Gascon, Pei de Garros, translated the Psalms into his dialect, and two years later published a volume of poems. His love for his native tongue is genuine, and his command over it considerable, he deplores its neglect, and urges others to follow his example. Augur Gaylard does infinitely less credit to his province, the popularity of his light pieces was probably due to their obscenity. More in the spirit of Garros is the charming trilingual salad composed by the famous Du Bartas in honor of a visit of Marguerite de Valois to N.A. Copyright R.A.C., Three nymphs dispute as to whether she should be welcomed in Latin, French, or Gascon, and the last, of course, wins the day. Provence proper gave birth to a poet of considerable importance in Louis Bellotta de la Belle of Grasse, who, after studying at Aix, enlisted in the royal armies and was made a prisoner at Moulins in 1572. During his captivity he wrote poems inspired by real love of liberty and of his native country. At Aix Belaudet it subsequently became the center of a literary circle which included most of the local celebrities, all of these paid their tribute to the poet's memory in the edition of his works published by his uncle, Pierre Paul himself the author of pieces of small value, included in the same volume. Even when Bellaudet is wholly frivolous, and intent on worldly pleasures only, his work has interest as reflecting the merry, careless life of the time. A writer very popular in Provence for the light-hearted productions of his youth was Claude Bruys, remarkable chiefly for comedies that deal largely with duped husbands. There is a certain charm, too, in the comedies of Claude's disciple, Gaspard Zerbin, and those critics who have read the plays of Jean de Cabanes and of Seguin, 
still in Miz, speak highly of them. The most consistently popular form of poetry in the south of France was always the novel. There has been no limit to the production of these, but very rarely does the author deserve special mention. An exception must be made in the case of Nicolas Saboli, who produced the best pieces of this class, both as regards beauty of language and the devotion they breathe. They have deservedly maintained their popularity to the present day. In Languedoc four poets have been cited as the best of the age Gaud Ellen, Michel, Lesage, and Bonnet. This is certainly so in the case of Pierre Gaud Ellen, of Toulouse, the most distinguished name in Occitan literature between the period of the troubadours and that of Jasmine. He had a good classical education, traces of which appear in all his poetry, his language, and his manner being always admirable, even where his matter is lacking in depth. He is often called the Malherbe of the South, but resembles that writer only in form, his poetry, taken as a whole, has far more sap. Gaud Ellen essayed and was successful in almost every short genre, the piece of his which is most generally admired being the stanzas to Henry IV of France, though others will prefer him in his gayer moods. He enjoyed enormous popularity, but never prostituted his art to cheap effects. His influence, especially but not exclusively in the Occitan area, has been deep and lasting. The fame of Jean Michel, of N.A. registered trademark mess, rests on the Embarras de la Foyer de Beaucaire, a poem of astonishing vigour, but deficient in taste. Daniel Sage, of Montpellier, was a man of loose morals, which are reflected in nearly all his works, his moments of genuine inspiration from other causes are rare. More worthy of being bracketed with Gaud Ellen is the Avocat Bonnet, author of the best among the open-air plays that were annually performed at B.A. Copyright Zier's on Ascension Day, a number of these were subsequently collected, but none can compare with the opening one, Bonnet's Jugement de Paris. Another very charming poet is Nicolas Fizes, of Frontenese, whose play, the OPA copyright R.A. de Frontenese, dealing with a slight love intrigue, and an idyllic poem on the fountain of Frontenese, show a real poetic gift. A number of Toulouse poets, mostly laureates of the Academy, may be termed followers of Gaud Ellen, of these Frana O.I.S. Boudet deserves mention who composed an ode, L.E. Trinf del Moundi, in honour of his native dialect. The classical revival that may be noted about this time is also generally ascribed to Gaudlin's influence. Its most distinguished representative was Jean de Vales, of Montac, who made excellent translations from Virgil and Persius, and wrote a brilliant burlesque of the former in the manner of Scara. He also composed a pastoral idyll, which, though too long and inclined to obscenity, contains much tender description. The greatest of the pastoral poets was Frerioas de Quartet, of Prades, whose comedies, Raymonet and Mersamondo, are written with such true feeling and in so pure a style that they can be read with real pleasure. A comedy of his dealing with Sancho Panza in the Palace of the Duke has been edited. It is difficult to understand the enormous popularity of Dabas, of Corsi, who belonged to the working classes, he was patronized by the nobility in exchange for panegyrics. Gascony produced two typical works in the 17th century, Utters Gent om Gascon and Dast Ross Trinf de la Longue Gascon. The former depicts a regular boasting Gascon who distinguishes himself in everything, while the latter is a plea in favour of the Gascon tongue, inspired by a genuine love of country. Gabriel Bedout is chiefly noted for his amorous solitary, called forth by the sufferings he endured from a hard-hearted mistress. Louis Baron, 
living peacefully in his native village of Poalabrin, celebrated it with great tenderness. In the 18th century the number of authors is much larger, but the bulk of good work produced is not equally great in proportion. The priests are mainly responsible for the literary output of Languedoc. Claude Peyrot one of them, celebrates his county with true rural spirit in the Printemps Ruagat and Quarter Sosis. But the chief of the band is the Abbe Favre, the prior of Pselanouve, whose surmount de Moussa's sister, delivered by a drunken priest against intemperance, is a masterpiece. He also wrote a successful mock heroic poem Travesties of Homer and Virgil, a prose novel depicting the country manners of the time, and two comedies, which likewise give a vivid picture of the village life he knew so well. Two genuine poets are the brothers Regard of Montpellier, Augusta's description of a vintage is deservedly famous, and Cyril produced an equally delightful poem in the Amours de Mount P.A. copyright. Pierre Hellies of Toulouse a poet of the people, whose vicious life finds an echo in his works, has a certain rude charm, at times distantly recalling Villon. In the province to saint Gro, of Lyon, holds undisputed sway. His style and language are admirable, but unfortunately he wasted his gifts largely on trivial pieces de occasion. Coy's comedy, The Frank Pair, is bright and still popular, while Germain's description of a visit paid by the ancient gods to Marseille has considerable humour. In Gascony the greatest poet is Syrian Desporins, whose pastoral idols and mournful chansons, which he himself set to music, are imbued with tenderness and charm. The French Revolution produced a large body of literature, but nothing of lasting interest. However, it gave an impetus to thought in the Occitan area, as elsewhere, and there, as elsewhere, it called forth a spirit of independence that was all in favour of a literary revival. Scholars of the stamp of Rain Ward, of Aix, occupied themselves with the brilliant literary traditions of the Middle Ages, newspapers sprang up, poets banded together and collected their pieces in volume form. Much has been written about the precursors de fa copyright libridge, and critics are sorely at variance as to the writers that most deserve this appellation. We shall not go far wrong if we include in the list Hyacinth Morel, of Avignon, whose collection of poems, Lou Sabolet, has been republished by Fra Copyright de Copyright Rick Mistral, Louis O'Banel, of N.A. Registered Trademark Mess, the successful translator of Anacreon S. Odes, Augusta Tandon, the troubadour of Montpellier, who wrote fables, Comte et autre pieces en vert, Fabre d'Olivet, the versatile Lita copyright writer who in 1803 published Le Troubadour, Poa copyright Cis Occitanux, which, in order to secure their success, he gave out as the Work of some medieval poet Diolophit, who wrote a didactic poem, in the manner of Virgil, relating to silkworm breeding, Jacques Azis, author of satires, fables, etc., Diastros, a writer of fables in La Fontaine's manner, Castel Blaise, who found time, amidst his musical pursuits, to compose Provena al poems, intended to be set to music, the Marquis de la Ferrale, author of some light satirical tales. While these writers were all more or less academic, and appealed to the cultured few, four poets of the people addressed a far wider public, Verdi, of Bordeaux, who wrote comic and satirical pieces, Jean Ribol, the baker of N.A. registered trademark mess, who never surpassed his first effort, L.N.G.T. L'Enfant, Victor Gelou, relentless and brutal, but undeniably powerful of his kind, and, 
greatest of them all, the true and acknowledged forerunner of the Feli Bress, Jacques Jasmine, whose poems, both lyrical and narrative, continue to find favor with men of the highest culture and literary attainments, as with the villagers for whom they were primarily intended. While much of this literature was still in the making, an event took place which was destined to eclipse in importance any that had gone before. In 1845 Joseph Romanelli of St. R.A. Copyright My, became usher in a small school at Avignon, which was attended by Fra Copyright de Copyright Rick Mistral, a native of the same district, then 15 years of age. The former, feeling the germs of poetry within him, had composed some pieces in French, but, finding that his old mother could not understand them, he was greatly distressed. One of his chief titles to fame is that, together with Alphonse Daudet, he drew the attention of La Martine to Mistral's Mireo. Romanelli and Mistral showed their gratitude by republishing the best pieces of these two precursors, together with those of Castile Blaise and others, in Unliamita Raisin and determined thenceforth to write in his native dialect only. These poems revealed a new world to young Mistral, and spurred him on to the resolve that became the one purpose of his life de remettre en lumiere et conscience de sa gloire cette noble race que mirabonama encore la nation provena ale. Mistral's personality and works are certainly better known than his fellows. Still, in studying the Provena al Renaissance, Romanelli's great claims should not be overlooked, and they have never been put forward with more force than by Mistral himself. Romanelli's secular verse cannot fail to appeal to every lover of pure and sincere poetry, his novels are second only to those of Saboli his prose works sparkling with delightful humor. He it was who in 1852 collected and published Lee Proven Allo, an anthology in which all the names yet to become famous, and most of those famous already, are represented. In 1853 he was one of the enthusiastic circle that had gathered round J.B. God at Ike's and whose literary output is contained in the room of Agadei Trubair and in the short-lived journal Lou Gay Saber. At the same time the first attempt at regulating the orthography of Provena Al was made by him. And in 1854 he was one of the seven poets who, on May 21, foregathered at the castle of Fonts Gugni, near Avignon, and founded the Fa Copyright Libridge. The etymology of this word has given rise to much speculation, the one thing certain about the word is that Mistral came across it in an old Provena Al poem, which tells how the Virgin meets Jesus in the temple, among the seven felly breasts of the law. The outlines of the Constitution, as finally settled in 1876, are as follows. The region of the Feli Bridge is divided into four mantenna o. At the head of all is a consistory of fifty, presided over by the Capulia copyright, who is chief of the entire Feli Bridge. The head of each mantenna o is called Sendi, and at the head of each school is a Cabasxa superscript to you. The ordinary members, unlimited in number, are mantina ire. Annual meetings and fates are organized. The most widely read of the Feli Bridge publications is the Armina Pruvena O, which has appeared annually since, maintaining all the while its original scope and purpose, and though unpretentious in form, it contains much of the best work of the school. The other six were Mistral, Tha Copyright Odor Obanel, Ansel Matthew, E. Garson, Alphonse Taven, and Paul Gia Copyright R.A. Of these, T.H.A. Copyright Odor Obanel has alone proved himself worthy to rank with Mistral and Romanelli. Zani, 
the girl of his youthful and passionate love, took the veil, and this event cast a shadow over his whole life, and determined the character of all his poetry. His is, without a doubt, the deepest nature and temperament among the Feli Bress, and his lyrics are the most poignant. He has a keen sense of physical beauty in woman, and his verse is replete with suppressed passion, but he never sinks to sensuality. His powerful love drama Lu Pao Do Pekat was received with enthusiasm at Montpellier in 1878, and successfully produced by Antoine at his theatre Libreno Mean Criterion. It is the only play of real consequence that the school has yet produced. We need not do more than glance at the work of the fourth of the group of poets who alone, amidst the numerous writers of lyrics and other works that attain a high level of excellence. One of the most pleasing features of the movement is the spirit of fraternity maintained by the Fa Copyright Libres with the poets and literary men of northern France, Catalonia, Italy, Romania, Germany, and other countries. In common with so many other productions of the Feli Brige, this almanac is published by the firm J. Rumanelli, Libraire Diter, Avignon. Felix Grass settled at Avignon in his youth. His rustic epic, Lee Carbonia Copyright is full of elemental passion and abounds in fine descriptions of scenery, but it lacks proportion. The heroic jest of Tolaza, in which Simon de Montfort's invasion of the South is depicted with unbounded vigor and intensity, shows a great advance in art. Lou Romancero Provena O is a collection of poems instinct with Provena al lore, and in Lee Popolino we have some charming prose tales that bring to life again the Avignon of the Popes. Finally, the poet gave us three tales dealing with the period of the Revolution, their realism and literary art called Fourth General Admiration. While Mistral and many of the best Feli Bress employ the dialect of the Bouches du RHANE, others, who have since seceded as the Fa Copyright Libridge Latin, prefer to use the dialect of Montpellier, owing to its central position. A third class favors the dialect of Limousin, considering it has been used by the troubadours. Nearly all the leaders of the Feli Bridge are legitimists and Catholics. There are exceptions, however, chief among them the Protestant Grass, whose Tolaza clearly reflects his sympathy with the Albigenses. Yet this did not stand in the way of his election as K. Pulia copyright proof, if proof were needed, that literary merit outweighs all other considerations in this artistic body of men. Finally, it may be noted that the Feli Bress have often been accused of lack of patriotism towards northern France, of schemes of decentralization, and other heresies, but none of these charges holds good. The spirit of the movement, as represented by its leaders, has never been expressed with greater terseness, force and truth than in the three verses set by Felix Grass at the head of his Carbonia copyright. I love my village more than thy village, I love my province more than thy province, I love France more than all. Despite 200 years of suppression by successive French centralist governments and the official prohibition of the language at school, in the administration and in the media, Occitan and Occitania have never ceased to inspire poets and authors. To the day, Article 2 of the French Constitution denies the existence and legitimacy of culturally rich and elaborate idioms such as Catalan, Breton, Basque and Occitan, among others. And though the use of the latter has been greatly affected by what is known as La Fergonha a Euro which is the physical, legal, artistic and moral repression of the tongue in all areas of society aiming at making children feel ashamed of their parents' language to the benefit of French, a Euro every region of the country of AC gave birth to literary geniuses, Joan Bowden in Guyenne, 
Marcella del Pastor in Limousin, Roba RT Lafont in Provence, Bernard Manciet in Gascony and Max Rocada in Languedoc. All genres of modern international literature are present in Occitan, especially since the second half of the 20th century, although some avant-garde Occitan literature already existed from the late 19th century. <laughs>